I've written over 4,000 songs. So of those 4,000 songs, I think I've had 1,200 recorded. And of those 1,200 recorded, I've had 80 of them be in the top 40. And of those, I think it's maybe 15 have been in the top 10. So it takes 4,000 songs to, to make 10 good ones. I had a group uh, that I formed in New York City called Desmond Child and Rouge, along with my girlfriend at the time, Maria Vidal. There's her portrait. We lived together for four years, and we formed our group, and we played all around New York, and this was before we had a record deal. And we played at a club called Tracks on West 72nd Street. And Paul Stanley used to come and hang out, and he'd be backstage with us. And I really didn't know that much about Kiss. I, I, you know, Kiss, to me, was kind of very hard rock, but also was something that very young kids listened to. So um, I just knew him as a great person. And he loved, uh, he loved being around the girls. And you know, I think he had a little bit of a, a shine for Maria. <laughs> and um, you know, who she and I were just kind of breaking up at that time, so it was kind of, it was okay. <laughs> and so um, he, he said, hey, we should try writing a song. So I helped to co-write I Was Made For Loving You. Tonight, I want to give it all to you In the darkness, there's so much I want Writing a rock song over a disco song was my idea because I had just gotten a drum machine and I loved the sound of it and the kind of uh, discipline of it. So I, you know, I kind of suggested it and Gene was totally against it because it's not you know, the kind of rock that he was used to performing. But the fusion of R&B, disco, feeling, it also had a Motown feel with rock, kind of changed the course of pop music. So that song really ignited my career as a collaborator with bands. But it was around that time that I also realized that I was more gay than I was straight and more gay than I was bi. And, uh, um, and so it, our group broke up because it was very difficult to keep going as a couple and with the group. But you know, in the end, it, I guess everything happened as it was going to happen because if I had stayed being an artist, I wouldn't have written all the songs that I did for all the other people. So in the end, I've sold more records than each of the individual artists that yeah. I was writing with. It's one of the most profound, most successful, and personally rewarding experiences to work with John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora. They were really in motion before I joined the creative team. And um, there was an instant chemistry. Tommy used to work on the docks. Maria and I lived in a little apartment, and I stayed home, and I was writing songs. And she was working as a waitress. And at that restaurant, they called her Gina because they reminded her of Gina Lola Brigida. Gina works the diner all day. And 
And so when I went to write the song with John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, I was thinking about, you know, me being, you know, my real name is John. So I, it was Johnny and Gina. And then uh, John Bon Jovi said, no, it can't be Johnny because that's my name. Then people think it's singing about me. Yeah. So, I, so I said, okay, Tommy. So it went Tommy and Gina. So it was a chemistry between me and John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, and also the skill sets that we had to bring to the table. Because I grew up on the East Coast, and I had a lot of experience and exposure to R&B music. So they were really into hard rock. And so somehow, working together, the grooves that got into the music had a kind of R&B influence, and also the lyrics, instead of just being about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, we started telling human stories, like in Living on a Prayer, that had a more of a singer-songwriter feeling. <laughs> So many songs that I had success with had irony. You give love a bad name. I hate myself for loving you. How can we be lovers if we can't be friends? That's called the tension of the opposites. There has to be some kind of tension inside a song, um, and irony is like opposite ends, so it becomes a frame of a picture. So there's that and also the archetype of the, the person that's going to sing it. They can only sing what their archetype is believable singing. Uh, you know, there's uh, the devil and then there's the angel. Those are angels, right? Those are archetypes, devils and angels. So where does Alice Cooper fall into? Devil side. Your crew. Vincent Fournier, who's his real name, is the son of a preacher. So he grew up with a very strong religious background. So he created this dark alter ego, and we love it. It fulfills the dark side of what we want. Then who's, who's an angel? I would say John Bon Jovi is like, a, is it like an angel? He's blonde, he's beautiful, he's heroic. Um, he stands for all the right good things. So he's on the opposite end. You know, I, I would say Steven Tyler lands in the devil side. song called Dude Looks Like a Lady that I co-wrote with Steven Tyler and Joe Perry of Aerosmith. Uh, the opening line is, walked into a bar on the shore, her picture graced the grime on the door. And so I'm very sensitive to that inner rhyming and alliteration. You know, her picture graced the grime, you know, those those, those two sounds. And that's the glue that holds songs together because what you need is for the audience to listen to it one time and feel very familiar. And 
clean rhymes are very satisfying to the, to the ear. And also, the most important thing is a title. And then everything would serve the title. All the different ways that you could interpret a title. You know, or at least a very strong concept of what the song was about. But usually, a killer title is a must. The very first day I met them, they were creating a track. And then Steven said, hey, what do you think of this? Uh, da 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 cruising for the ladies. Da 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 cruising for the ladies. And I, this is the first words out of my mouth. I said, I think that's really bad. And they looked at me like, what? Arms crossed, you know, kind of looking at me like this. And um, I knew I had like five minutes before I was going to be escorted out by security. And Steven said, well, when I first came up with that riff, I was singing, Dude Looks Like a Lady. And I said, what? That's perfect. That's amazing. Steven told me the story that the way he came up with it was because they had gone to a bar and you know there was the kind of like an empty bar and at the very end was there was this gorgeous you know big uh, blonde you know very curvy uh, you know black nails and it, it was this giant you know kind of teased up mullet and um, you know the guys were saying okay they were taking you know drawing straws who was going to go over there and you know say hi to her or something like that you know how it is very high school but you know these are like you know 40 year old guys you know kind of going should we go over there and so suddenly she turns around and it's vince neal of motley crew and and they went like oh my god that's crazy oh that's, that's crazy and uh, uh steven started going that dude looks like a lady dude looks like a lady dude looks like a lady but in the song he decides to go with it anyway. That song also has that contrast of opposites. And he goes, my funky lady, I like it, like it, like it, like that. And, and the second verse is, never judge a book by its cover or who you're gonna love by your lover. If you like the way it looks, you like the way it feels, you go for it. Dude. 